I don't know if you can tell, but I'm a little frustrated. I'm a little frustrated by this, this golf ball. I don't know if you remember from last week, we were on the golf course at Mathville, and we were on the driving range, and we had pyramid stacks of golf balls in which we wanted to find uh, the volume of the golf balls and the volume of a case that covered those golf balls. Now, I didn't tell you this last week, but Coach Patterson's math house is actually in Mathville, on the golf course at Mathville. And these golf balls, they keep flying into my backyard. They keep plunking into my pool and bouncing off my trampoline. And my wife's getting a little frustrated that they're messing up her beautiful flowers in her triangular flower bed. So I got to thinking, what would be the probability of this golf ball landing in those three things I just talked about, the pool in my backyard, the trampoline in my backyard, or the flower bed. Flower bed. So let's go ahead and look at the problem today. And one thing that we'll notice is that the golfers in Mathville, they're really good math-minded people, but they're not very good golfers. Okay, so here we go. The house is on the Mathville golf course continually have golf balls that land in their yards. Now, if it is equally likely that the golf ball could land in any place in the backyard, what is the probability that it lands in or on the rectangular pool, the circular trampoline, or the isosceles right triangular flower bed? We're going to round this to the nearest percent. The second part of this problem is that we are going to look at different types of probability. Is this probability experimental probability, or is it theoretical probability? And how can we use a fair simulation to calculate experimental probability? Okay, now, essential questions. We're going to um, ask the question or answer this. How can I calculate the geometric probability of a point chosen at random in a given region? And how can I determine experimental probability using a fair method? You are going to need a pencil a calculator in a sheet of paper today. Let's go ahead. I want to show you the dimensions of my backyard. This is what Coach Patterson's backyard looks like in Mathville. Okay, I've got my rectangular pool and my circular trampoline and my right isosceles triangular flower bed. Now, if you look a little closer, because remember, this is Mathville. This is what is actually embedded in the dimensions of my backyard. Okay, we have a right triangle with a 30 degree angle. We'll look at that in a minute. We've got a, a trampoline where we know the circumference is 16 pi, and we've got a isosceles right triangle. Now, if we want to find the probability of an event occurring, like in this case, we want to find the probability this golf ball is going to land in either the pool, the trampoline, or the flower bed. We want to take the number of favorable outcomes. That's the amount of possible, uh, possible outcomes for what we're looking for. That's favorable outcomes. Okay, and then we want to look at over the number of total possible outcomes. Now, when we're talking about geometric probability, the favorable outcome is going to be the area of the regions in which I'm trying to find the probability will the golf ball land in those areas. And total possible is going to be the entire region that the golf ball can land in, which is the backyard. Okay, so we are going to take for the probability of the golf ball landing in or on the pool, the flower bed, or the trampoline, we're going to take the area of the pool, the area of the trampoline, and the area of the flower bed. We're going to take the sum of those and divide it by the total area of the backyard. Now, you can see there is multiple pieces of this that we're going to have to find the area of. So we're going to work through this in parts so that we can find that probability that we're looking for. Now, the first part is we're just going to go ahead and find the total area of the backyard, and then we'll find the area of the other three 
parts of the backyard. Okay, these are the dimensions of the backyard that we are looking at today. Now, if you notice, this is not a perfect rectangle, but it can be divided into multiple rectangles to find the total area. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to divide this backyard into rectangles. So I divided it this way. There are multiple different ways that you could divide this rectangle or divide this backyard into rectangles. The way that I divided it is into rectangle one, rectangle two, and rectangle three. So if we want to find the total area of the backyard, we're going to take the area of rectangle one plus the area of rectangle two plus the area of rectangle three. Now the dimensions for rectangle one are, this full length is 75, this length right here is 15, so 75 minus 15 is 60 feet times the width of 140. So 60 times 140 is 8,400 square feet. That's the area of rectangle one. The area of rectangle two, its dimensions are 15 times 86, which is 1,290 square feet. And then rectangle three is 30 by 30, which is 900 square feet for a total of 10,590 square feet. So it is equally likely that a golf ball could land anywhere within the area of this backyard. Okay, so now we want to find the favorable outcomes, which is the sum of the pool, area of the pool, the area of the trampoline, and the area of the flower bed. Now, let's move on to find the area of the pool. Now, if you notice this here, first off, this pool is a rectangle. And we know the area formula for a rectangle is base times height. Or you'll see it written sometimes as length times width. Now, something interesting about this problem, though. All we know is that it's a right triangle, that this diagonal is 40 feet long, and there's a 30-degree angle here. Now, the question to ask is, what type of triangle is this that we've learned about before in the past, and what do we need to find? Now, we need to find the other two leg lengths of this right triangle. If I do that, that'll be the base and the height of the rectangular pool that we can find the area of. Now, but you're probably thinking, okay, we can use right triangular trig. So Katoa, sine, cosine, and tangent. And that's absolutely right. Or you can use your special right triangle rules. A 30, 60, 90 right triangle, or in a minute we'll see a 45, 45, 90 right triangle. Now, let me refresh your memory on the rules for a 30, 60, 90 right triangle. For a 30, 60, 90. Now, remember, if this angle is 30, the other acute angle must be 60 because the sum of all three is 180. 30 plus 60 is 90 plus another 90 is 180 degrees. Now, if our hypotenuse is 40 feet, which it is, okay, that is going to be double the short leg. Now, how we label this or how we, um, the phrases we use to identify the sides, the language is going to be short leg, long leg, and the hypotenuse. Now, if the short leg is A, so if it's a length, the hypotenuse is double that, okay? And the long leg is the short leg times the square root of three. Now, this is derived from an equilateral triangle and the height that splits the equilateral triangle right down the middle, okay? Now, so let's look over here. And what we're looking for is we're looking for the length of these two sides. I'll call them B and H because that's going to end up being our base and our height for the rectangle. Now, remember, if this is 30, we know this is 60. We are going to work from the hypotenuse, which in my classes for 30, 60, 90, we always call it the hypotenuse because we're going to divide by 2 
40 divided by 2 is 20, and then we're going to multiply by the square root of 3 to produce the long leg. Now, a way to remember this, we're going to put a square around the 3 to remind us to use the square root of 3. So put a square around that 3 and that 30 to remind us to use the square root of 3. So that's 20 on the square root of 3. So now, we have the dimensions of our rectangular pool. The height is 20 and the base is 20 on the square root of 3. Okay, so area is base times height. When we multiply 20 square root of 3 times 20, that produces an area of 400 on the square root of 3 feet squared. Now, we're going to leave it in simplified radical form now. We're going to leave it in simplified radical form because we want an exact answer. The earlier we, we round, the less precision we have and accuracy we have in the final answer. So we're going to leave this in simplified radical form. Now, let's move on to the area of the right isosceles triangular flower bed. Now, we got to think for a second. What does it mean for a triangle to be right and isosceles. Now recall, a right triangle has one right angle, isosceles has two congruent sides. So this is what an isosceles right triangle looks like. Has one right angle and two congruent sides. Now, if you look at it closely, you probably notice that it's half of a square so if you took a square, which all sides are congruent and all angles are right angles, and you cut across the diagonal, this would be one half of a square. Now think about that for a second. If each angle on a square is 90, one half of that would be 45. So this has created a 45-45-90 special right triangle. Now, Let's recap the rules for a 45-45-90. Because it's half of a square, the legs are always congruent, and the hypotenuse is times square root of 2. Okay, The legs are always congruent, and the hypotenuse is times square root of 2. Now, the 30-60-90 and the 45-45-90 rules, the ACT seems to really like those because they tend to embed those in problems so it's really an important thing to know because that can save you time on the ACT. One way that we remember the rules in class is this. A, A, A root 2. A, A, A root 2. If my leg was 4, we would say 4, 4, 4 root 2 would be the hypotenuse. So now, here we have a hypotenuse of 24 and we want to find the leg. Now, again, we know this is a 45-45-90 right triangle. So we want to move from the hypotenuse to the leg. So here, we are going to not multiply by square root of 2, but divide by square root of 2. And think about this logically. The side length is decreasing in length. Okay, so the side length is decreasing to a shorter size, so we're going to divide. So this leg here is going to be 24 divided by square root of 2. Now, we have a radical in our denominator. Okay, we cannot divide by an irrational number, so we're going to multiply by what I call a fancy 1. It's a fancy way of just expressing a 1. This is going to allow us to get rid of the radical in the denominator. This is called rationalizing the denominator, making the denominator rational. So now we have this, 24 times square root of 2 is 24 square root of 2, divided by square root of 2 times square root of 2 is the square root of 4, and the square root of 4 is 2. And that simplifies to 12 on the square root of 2. Okay, so this is 12 square root of 2, and this side here is also 12 square root of 2. Now, Remember, we're trying to find the area here. And the area for a triangle is one half base times height or base times height divided by two. The base and the height of a triangle are the sides 
that form the right angle. So if you notice this side and this side, they both form the right angle with each other. So this is going to be the base and the height of the right triangle. So we're going to take base times height and we're going to divide it by 2. So again, there's our dimensions. So now our base and our height are 12 square root of 2 times 12 square root of 2 divided by 2. Think about this. 12 times 12 is 144. Square root of 2 times square root of 2 is the square root of 4, which is 2. So you should have this. 144 times 2 divided by 2. 144 times 2 is 288. Divided by 2 is 144. If you wanted to go ahead and divide these out right here, you could. And that produces an area of this right isosceles triangular flower bed as 144 square feet. Now, find the area of a circular trampoline. Okay. All we're given for this problem is that the circumference is 16 pi. Now remember, the circumference is the distance around a circle. So we have the distance, but we want to find area. Now back in week one, we talked about a problem-solving strategy called Pudwick. Put down what you know. For, for this problem, if I know that we need to find the area, I'm going to go ahead and write down the area formula. Area for a circle is power squared. Now, we realize here, the one thing we're missing to find the area is the radius. So we need to calculate the radius given the circumference of 16 pi. Okay, now, put down what we know. We know the circumference formula for a circle is 2 pi r. So when we put that down, we know circumference is 2 pi r, and now we're going to solve for the radius. So 16 pi equals 2 pi r. We'll divide both sides by 2 pi. Those will divide out. And then 16 pi divided by 2 pi is 8. Okay, the pi is divided out, and 16 divided by 2 is 8. So we've found the radius. The radius is 8. Now we can find the area of the circular trampoline. Okay, which is pi times 8 squared. 8 squared is 64, so we have 64 pi. We're going to leave it in that form right now. We're going to leave it in terms of pi because, again, we want to round at the very end because we want as close to a precise answer as we can get. All right, now, so we want to find the probability that that golf ball is going to land in either the pool, the flower bed, or the trampoline. So we want to take the three areas that we've calculated and divide by the area of the backyard. So we have 400 on the square root of 3 for the pool, 64 pi for the trampoline, 144 for the flower bed. We add that together and divide by the total area of the backyard, and we get approximately 0 0.09800578. Now, the problem said to round to the nearest percent. So remember, percent means out of 100. So we're going to move the decimal to the hundredths place. So when we move the decimal to the hundredths place, that puts this out of 100, and it would be 9.80%. But to round to the nearest whole number, the nearest percent, this is approximately 10%. So it's approximately 10% likely that with the really bad golfers in Mathville, that when the golf balls land in my backyard, that it's going to hit one of these objects in my backyard. Now, this brings up an interesting topic or question is, is that actually what's going to happen? Say there was, say the golfers are really bad in Mathville, and over the course of a year, there's a thousand golf balls that land in my backyard. Are only a hundred of them going to land? So say a hunt, so a thousand golf balls, are only a hundred of them going to land in the pool, the flower bed, or the trampoline? Now, we wouldn't know that until we try it out, create an experiment in which we test it with trials. That leads us to our next part of this problem, 
is the difference between theoretical probability and experimental probability. Now, theoretical probability is what should occur. Experimental probability is what actually occurs. Now, what we've calculated so far, that approximately 10% probability, that's theoretical. By calculating the areas, okay, divided by the areas of those three objects, divided by the area of the backyard, in theory, it should only land in those objects 10% of the time. But we wouldn't know that actually until we create an experiment. So, that is what we're going to do next. So the question is, is the approximately 10% probability of the golf ball landing in or on the pool, trampoline, or flower bed theoretical or experimental? Okay, we said that was theoretical. Now, let's set up a simulation and let's simulate this to create an experiment. Now, because landing in those three objects can happen, is going to happen theoretically 10% of the time, I'm going to use a random number generator from 1 to 100. And I'm going to let the first 10 numbers, 1 through 10, represent the probability that it will land in one of those three areas. And I'm going to let numbers 11 through 100 represent the probability that the golf ball does not land in the pool, flower bed, or trampoline. Okay, so here we go. In class, I do this a lot. I just use my phone and I use Siri. Siri has a random number generator on there that will allow us to generate random numbers. Now, I've already done 30 for us. So out of 30 earlier when I was creating this problem, I got four that were between the numbers 1 and 10, and I got 26 that were between the numbers of 11 and 100. So I want to come over here, and we're going to continue this for five more. Okay, so I'm going to use Siri. Pick a number 1 through 100. It's 28. Okay, Siri said 28. I'm going to put another tally mark here. Pick a number 1 through 100. The answer is 4. 4. I'll put a tally mark here. Pick a number 1 through 100. That would be 50. 50. Another tally mark between 11 and 100. Pick a number 1 through 100. It's 48. 48. Here and one more. Pick a number 1 through 100. That would be 70. 70. Okay, so we're here. All right, now let's look at the tally marks okay, here and let's calculate the experimental probability. Out of 35 tries, there was 5 from 1 to 10. Now, if I calculate that in my calculator, 5 divided by 35 is approximately 0 0.1428, which is 14.3%, or if we round to the nearest percent, approximately 14%. Now, what you notice is that that is actually not the same. It is not the same as what we calculated earlier, the 10%. Now, how many tests do you think you would need to run for the theoretical probability and the experimental probability to be the same? Now, this is called the law of large numbers. If we increased it, say, to 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000, the law of large numbers says as you increase the number of trials, that the experimental probability will approach the theoretical probability. So if we went to 10,000 or 100,000 trials, then it should be get really, really close to happening 10% of the time. Now, this has been another fun week of exploring some geometry concepts. This next week, we're going to stay right here in my backyard in Mathville, and we're going to explore some different concepts when it comes to the, the flower bed and the pool and the rest of the backyard. Have a great week. Okay, well, we'll see you, see you next Tuesday.